Now I'm going to let the president of the Council on Cancer come up and introduce the speaker. I'm the president of the Council on Cancer. <laughs> As, uh, you didn't guess that? Okay. Dr. Fegu is our uh, featured speaker tonight and is going to speak on uh, immunotherapy, a very exciting new way of treating cancer. She has an extensive and an amazing and very interesting resume. Let me go through some of it quickly. She received an MD from Beijing Medical University, then a PhD in biophysics from Purdue University. Then she did an internship at St. Vincent Hospital, Worcester, Massachusetts, followed by a residency at Bayfield State Medical Center, Springfield, Massachusetts, then a fellowship at Tufts Medical Center, Boston, Massachusetts. And then she spent three years working at UMass University Hospital. And then the last three years, she spent working at St. Vincent's Cancer Center here in, not here, but down in Santa Fe. She's participated in numerous uh, clinical trials and happens to have garnered a number of awards. So please welcome Dr. Faye Gu. Okay, so I have my, you can hear me, right? I can hear you. Okay, great. Well, I really love to be here. Actually, my first two years after I came to this state, I was coming up here every week, one day a week. We have a clinic here, so I was coming here to do the cancer, you know, hematology. And um, just a year ago, I moved back to Santa Fe full time because Dr. Lopez it's really a great thing that he can be here full time as a cancer doctor here. So I really have a very um, nice um, feeling about this community or like a special uh, feeling about this community because I love the, uh, you know, there are a lot of scientists here. Um, and so we could actually talk about, and I found some Purdue alumni here. I think it shouldn't, people shouldn't be surprised maybe. But anyway, uh, but it's great to be here. I've been wanting to do this. And so when Tom asked me, um, I just really, I was happy. And really the topic I picked, uh, do I have a pointer or I just point? That's fine, no worries. So um, it's an easy topic because it's really very exciting in um, cancer <coughs> therapy nowadays to talk about immunotherapy. And so if we go to the next slide, so someone will help me there. Okay, um, so these are the objectives for tonight. Um, it really, it, it serves as an introduction on immunotherapy. I want to just tell you some basic concepts and to understand historically, you know, how we get, got here and why this is making such a huge uh, impact in cancer uh, treatment. And also, I will use two examples, although not necessarily like colon cancer as a cancer subtype to highlight immunotherapy, but I think it's a good disease area where I can talk to you about some of the challenges that we have. And then the CAR T cell um, therapy for diffuse large B cell lymphoma and then lastly, I think I wanted to really um, help you to walk away from this talk with a little sense of, you know, maybe venture, like this is a very exciting time, but also to understand that even with all the um, you know, breakthrough, um, all the progress in cancer treatment, um, each individual case, each individual patient, um, the decision making is still, you know, like one-on-one, -on -one, individual one. Uh, it's based on risk and benefit balance. So that's the objective. So now let's go on to the next slide. So hallmarks of cancer. I don't know what comes to mind when we talk about cancer, right? So if we know, if we want to treat it, we really need to understand what it is. And so this 
Uh, next, click. So this was from January of 2000, almost 20 years ago. But you know, back then, this was a seminal paper that was published in Cell. And next slide, by these two gentlemen giants in the cancer biology field. So Dr. Hanahan and Dr. Weinberg. And so really, this paper summarized what we knew by then of the hallmarks of cancer. So the next slide, yeah, if you could see, um, they, they uh, summarized the, the hallmarks of cancer into six characteristics. So the green is the self-sufficiency in growth signal. And then the orange is like uh, insensitivity to stop signal on growth. And then the purple is uh, ability to metastasize. So that's what cancer is known for, right? And then the light blue is immortality. So cancer cells would just keep replicating and would not you know, stop. And then what's that color? Um, magenta? Uh, so that is a, a, a capability on angiogenesis. And that means that the cancer has the ability to build blood vessels um, around. So that's where the source of nutrition, growth factors, all that that's necessary for cancer growth. And um, the next one is, no, the, yeah, but anyway, the, the sixth uh, hallmark is um, um, ability to evade death. So apoptosis, it, that's a word for um, cell death. So cancer cells could just evade that and they don't die and they, they acquire um, immortality. So these six hallmarks really helped us to understand you know, what cancer is, right? And that's really, when you look at the cancer cells, that's what you see. And that's why they can keep growing and, you know, become a mass, um, as a tumor. And also that, because of our knowledge of those uh, hallmarks or characteristics, then we know how to treat it. So the main treatment, really, other than surgery, radiation, the regional therapy, our main treatment for cancer, especially the metastatic late stage cancer, is chemotherapy. So why? It's because chemotherapy would hit the fast growing cells. Okay, it hits. It works by um, stopping the the rapid replication uh, of cells. So so that's why it was the main driving force in especially late stage cancer treatment. Uh, but of course then coming with it, the downside is side effects from chemotherapy, like hair loss, lower blood counts, or like a lot of GI toxicity. Why? Because these are the cells that are constantly replicating, right? You have, you, you lose hair, but then you grow, so hair and then blood is constantly being replenished. The mucosa lining our GI um, tract is constantly growing. So then they take a hit from chemotherapy, although they don't grow as fast as cancer cells. So the cancer cells would die first, but then you have side effects. So that's what we understand. So a lot of this is not just, okay, you see a high headline and okay, this is a new cancer treatment or this, that. It's not random. It's really based on years of research and understanding of what cancer is. So the next slide. So more than a decade later, next slides or click. Um, and this is um, in 2011, so February of 2011. Okay, backtrack a little. Back, yeah. Yes, this is fine. So this, they published a um, update. Okay, so that reflected the knowledge that we gained in that decade, right? Where now two additional hallmarks are called emerging hallmarks of cancer cells. Uh, one is really the deregulating of cellular energetics, uh, which means that cancer cells are so smart or sneaky that they reprogram the energy um, metabolism. So they have a way of really um, take up all the nutrition and the sugar and to feed themselves first. And they beat all the normal cells. Okay, so that's one, one hallmark. 
And then the other one is really important is uh, cancer could avoid immune destruction. And that was kind of like something that we knew that cancer became cancer because they evaded immune surveillance. But how did that happen and what did that means? It really, in that decade, we developed very good knowledge of that. And so those are the two actual hallmarks. Altogether, there are eight hallmarks, but the hallmarks are really acquired behavior that make cancer cells cancer, right? But what really is the underlying characteristic that make cancer cells cancer? And so the two lower ones are the characteristics. And one is the genome instability and mutation, and the other is tumor promoting inflammation. So those two things are the underlying nature that uh, enabled cancer to become cancer from a normal behaving cells. Right? Because how do, how do cancer acquire the ability to evade all those things? Because the genome is constantly mutating. And so most of the mutations cannot sustain um, the cancer cells, or the cells would just get eliminated by our body. But when it does that all the time, then just by chance, one or you know, some few cells would become these you know, cancer cells. And, be able to grow. So, um, so those, and the, the uh, inflammation also we have come to know really has a close tie to um, cancer uh, formation. So the next slide, uh, you know, I think if you paid attention then you would know that last year the Nobel Medicine um, Award was awarded to the two real, um, you know, trailblazers in the field of immunotherapy. Uh, for cancer, because um, their work was actually in the 1990s and 2000s, so in that decade that I told you about. So their work was back then, and some the fruit of their work actually uh, started to realize in the past decade. And so that's what really convinced people that their research is so important, and so they won the Nobel Prize. So the next slide. So this actually is from the Nobel Prize website. So if you go there, you see this is a very simple illustration that um, explains their work. So immune system is so tricky, right? Um, in the 1990s or 80s, uh, people didn't really think immune re immunology research would lead to anything against cancer because we all try to understand about infections, you know, foreign invaders, or, and fight off infections, and then autoimmune disease, which is like a hyper-regulation of immune system. So immunologists were working in the field to, to try to, you know, solve those problems. But these uh, two people, they recognize that because of the tie, you know, cancer has to evade immune surveillance to make it. So what's really happening? So immune system is a very fine regulated system. Uh, one is, you know, hyper-regulated, you have autoimmune disease, right? One is insufficient, then you are more prone to infections. And so you have a fine, like, intricate network of regulators that regulate the immune system. So we have our innate immune system, which if it sees something foreign, it just attacks, right? So it's like the first line food soldiers. But then they're limited. So when they die or they're exhausted, then what do you do? So we all know a thing or two about our immune system from infections, how we you know, fight infections and vaccines. Um, because just having the first line food soldiers is not enough. The, really, the remarkable thing about immune system is its scalability. So it can really be scaled up to such a powerful defense against infection, for example. Uh, but it takes time. So that's why you have, we have vaccines which really plant the seed, like a memory, so to activate your immune system, but then it keeps the memory. So when the next time, when you truly have a exposure to an infection, then the immune system will just wake up and then scale up rapidly and then mount a very good you know, defense. Um, so that's why if you have a viral illness the first few days, you feel really bad, you know, but then your immune system would come to life and then start working and then would just 
get rid of the invaders. So, um, so the, that scalability is just remarkable. And also it's very selective, right? Selective to the point you have to get flu vaccines every year. Last year's flu vaccine may not work this year. So it's very specific. Yeah, so, um, so then in, in that, there, there are a lot of regulating molecules um, and players. So to the right, uh, or your left, uh, the CTLA-4, that's a work uh, based um, by Dr. Allison, one of the Nobel laureates. So the CTLA-4 is a molecule on the T cell. So you can see there the, the purple is the cancer cell. And up there, the APC is the antigen presenting cell. And that's a cell that would unmask or you know, identify this as an abnormal cell and present it to the T cell, which will take care of the tumor cells, right? But the CTLA molecule on the T cell is like a inhibitor where it freezes the cell in the inactive state. So, so the inactive state is like, so there's a gas pedal there. It's like CTLA is holding back the, the gas pedal and does not allow you to drive. Okay, so um, because it would lock down some activating uh, molecules to prevent them to swing into action. So Dr. Allison found that if you stop that by treating animal, you know, with a cancer or you know, treating cancer with a monoclonal antibody, so the antibody actually goes to find the CTLA4 to break that interaction with the active activating factors. That's like unfreeze the, the gas pedal, right? So the rest of the activating factors would activate the T cells. It's like giving gas on the T cells. So now T cell can go and work on, so the lower panel shows that now the activated T cell can go after the tumor cell, right? So, so that's like, that's how it works. Now the other one, the PD-1, is based more on uh, Dr. Han Yu, uh, the other Nobel laureate's work. So the PD-1 is a programmed death one. That's a protein. So similar to CTLA-4, except it's a little bit downstream. So now your T cell is activated and is ready to work, except PD-1 is holding it back, so like a brake. Okay, so you have the car, you're giving gas, but it can't go because PD-1 is there that is bound to the ligand of PD-1 that could be on the tumor cells or on the antigen, APC antigen presenting cells. So it's just dragging those molecules and preventing them to, to work. And so when you again treat these cells with a monoclonal antibody where you break PD-1 from PD-L1, now the PD-L1 actually exposes the tumor cells. So your, your immune system can totally just see where the tumor cells are. So the activated T cells can go after these cells. Now you, you have things working. So both are work by inhibiting the inhibitor. You see, right? To allow the T cells or the immune system to function like it's supposed to. Okay, so, so that's how it works. And based on this work, um, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so of course the, the tumor, the mechanisms of cancer to evade the immune system is more complicated. There are many ways of them, of accomplishing that. And um, this is a cartoon to illustrate different mechanisms. But basically starting from the tumor cells trying to downregulate um, it's um, the, the antigen processing, right? So the tumor cells have its own antigens that would be, you know, expressed on the surface of the tumor cells so the immune system can see, the antigen presenting cells can see and recognize these. So the tumor cells have a way of downregulating those uh, processing, so to hide, right? So to start from that, and then it would know to um, inhibit 
the activating factors, okay, and promote the inhibitory factors of the immune system and through all different mechanisms. And so tumor cells can make um, chemicals, uh, chemokines that would serve all these purposes that it wants. So it's really very complicated and it's, you know, a lot of research is in, in this uh, cartoon, representing the, this cartoon. But basically, you know, it's a very, um, so the cancer cells are pretty sophisticated to try to evade the immune surveillance. So the next slide. Um, so types of immunotherapy are, are that developed based on our understanding of these interactions, right? And the bottom two are easy to understand because they are just a natural, um, you know, spill over from our knowledge on immune, uh, immune system against infections, right? So we all know about vaccines. So there are therapeutic cancer vaccines. And so the two successful ones are, one is for prostate cancer, the Provenge uh, vaccine, and the other is the, um, um, the TVEC, which is newer, that's for melanoma. Um, but vaccines are really limited because remember I said, um, it depends on the antigenicity, and also we have to know that the target that these vaccines are after has to be really specific to that cancer, right? Otherwise, you would have um, toxicities or bystander um, side effects. So it, that's really hard. And the other thing is, why do we not have vaccines against every type of virus or bacteria? Because sometimes it's very hard to find a, a, an antigen, uh, you know, even if it's specific, but it's not very antigenic which means it's not strong enough to wake up the immune system. So it's very limited. So the, the tumor vaccine research is ongoing. Many different types of tumors and different vaccines are being studied. But really, the two that are on the market are the two I mentioned. And then the, the antibodies is just such a powerful um, immunotherapy for anything, really, because you can make a monoclonal antibody against any molecule, right? So if that molecule is a surface marker of a cancer cell, then you have a very specific treatment for that cancer. And this is really a very successful uh, field of therapeutics. So you have antibodies against, you know, B cells. So you have the lymphoma, you know, rituxan is the most successful, probably, antibody. And then you have like um, Herceptin, which is really an antibody against the HER2 positive breast cancer, and all kinds of antibody. And in the past, you, people were just making antibodies, and these antibodies uh, could go and find the cancer cells and, and destroy them. But now, to enhance that um, efficacy, newer ways of um, antibody, newer ways of conjugating antibody and the cytotoxic, like a toxin, with these antibodies are really trending now. Because in addition to this very specific antibody you're making against the cancer cells, you can link a, a toxin or like a magic bullet or something, whatever you can call it, right? So that's carried by this antibody, delivered to the cancer cells, and then kill the cancer cells right there. So it's very straightforward. And this is used in many different types of, you know, um, hematolo hematological malignancies or solid tumors, and it's really very successful. But today, we're going to talk about one example each. So the T cell checkpoint modulation up there, that is about what I talked to you about, right? Immune um, regulation. So you want to activate the activators, and you want to inhibit the inhibitors. So the end result is that you would really want to rev up, activate your immune defense mechanism. But when you think about activating something, you can, I think an analogy I can think about is when we want to do a project, we want to do something, right? Think about how you have to get every T's crossed, every dot, you know, like I started to get something to work. You really have to rally a team, everything has to be in place. For a car to drive, all the parts have to be in place for it to work, right? But how easy it is to stop something from working. 
Isn't that a lot easier? So inhibitors historically have been our go-to target because you can just put one thing in this process, you know, the assembly line, that will break and then just blow the whole operation off, right? So that's why it's the most uh, efficient way of getting something to work. So naturally, in that, you know, so the inhibitory receptors became better targets. So the CTLA4 and the PD-1, those are the inhibitory receptors. So they have really become prime targets and then a lot of work and then we had, you know, results from that. So the, the last one, the T-cell adoptive transfer is the most, you know, magical thing about immunotherapy because it's a way to really have a, the, the orange kind of looking bars. So the structure is drawn a lot like half of the antibody down there, doesn't it? Right? So, but it's an artificial chimera um, molecule where you have a top, the orange is the target, targeting element that's very specific, that comes from an individual patient's individual cancer cells. So it's very specific. But to make your immune system to amplify this quickly and be very powerful, the, the molecule can be engineered. So down there is the intracellular portion, right? That, that film, that, that line is really your cell membrane. So the intracellular domains can be engineered where they make this an activated T cell uh, receptor protein. Okay, so when you have this engineered and you infuse this to this patient, then it can really effectively kill the cancer cells. So it's a chimera antigen receptor or CAR T. If you've heard CAR T cell therapy, that's like a big thing in immuno oncology. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, you know, more detail using examples down um, later on. So the next slide. So this is just briefly, you know, this is the history of cancer immune, immunotherapy. Really, you look at the left-hand side, more than 100 some years, we really had no knowledge much. I mean, you know, like not, we didn't even know what cancer was. So cancer immunotherapy, it was just really, that was the, the, the time when we were slowly waking up and trying to understand, develop this concept of, you know, what is the immune system and what is the role, how does it work? First, in fighting off infections. But there were some primitive ideas like up uh, left treatment of cancer with bacterial project, products or coli's toxin. That's just killed bacteria parts. And then they, they would infuse that into cancer patients and just hope that it'll work. But basically, it's the idea of um, stimulating your immune defense system and hoping that that would do something to the cancer. So it was a very primitive way back. And some people still keep this, you know, and there, there, there are people who are still not giving up and still do the very primitive kind of, um, you know, like malaria, there were some reports and people actually got into trouble because it doesn't really work at that level anyway. But that's how, so we came a long way. So if you look at 1991 and four, around that time, that's when we started to understand human tumor antigens, we just realized that tumor cells can have their unique antigens different from our normal cells. And that's their vulnerability, right? Because once we can find those antigens, then we can differentiate them from the normal cells. That's what we are after. So, so but that's pretty recent still, right? 91. And from that point on, that's a decade. So 1990s and then 2000s, two decades where we, you know, more work, thanks to Dr. Allison, Dr. Hanyu and their colleagues, we started to really learn about um, immune, um, you know, modulation in, in cancer. And then, you know, I mentioned that uh, prostate vaccine, prostate cancer vaccine, FDA approval, that the Cipuluso T, that was 2010. And 2011, it was the approval of the anti-CTLA-4 
antibody in melanoma, right? So 2011, that's the year when the second paper on hallmarks of cancer was published. So because by then, we already knew a little bit about how it works. And um, but from that point on, if we go to the next slide. So next slide, please. You can see the explosion of drug. OK, these are drugs. Each individual line is an FDA approval. On um, like immuno-oncolytics, we call them, or IO. You can see that. You know. And these are antibodies. They're all antibodies uh, from different companies going after different cancers or lymphoma or myeloma. And, but each individual one is a approved indication. Okay, so, and you could see how 2011, that's there. And this is 2019. I sent my slides to Tom like a week ago, or like I had to modify my slides and add because the, the, the right hand corner, you see that April 11th, 2019. That's just, you know, last week, another approval. And so it's really, now we're really bearing fruit of all the research and all that work. Now we're seeing this as uh, drugs, these are approved for, for cancer and patients. So it's really exciting. Now, so based on, from all these, you know, a lot of clinical trials, research led to this. So what, what did we learn early on? So the next slide. Okay, so this is another way of looking at this. So um, all the, the, the black, you know, the, the bold black, letters, they're all drugs. The top one is the ipilimumab, or we call it ipi. And that's the anti-CTLA4 antibody. So, you know, the, the freezer of the gas pedal, right? So that's the only drug against that target. And then all these other bold character, you know, the nivolumab and then uh, Pembrolizumab, all these different MABs, they're monoclonal antibodies, that's why they're called MABs. So they are different companies' product or uh, antibodies against PD-1. So the other, the, the break, okay, inhibitor. Um, and the light circle there is first patient dosed in the clinical trial setting. And then the red circles are the times when they are approved by the FDA. You can see how way back it was, took a lot longer for these drugs to be approved, right? Because now we understand how it works and then these other companies would catch on and then they make me two drugs, you know, for better or for worse. And then you have all these other drugs and approved indications. And look at the red circles. The, these are all different malignancies. You have melanoma, HNC is head and neck cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, urothelial cancer, renal cell cancer, uh, Hodgkin's disease. So these are all different kinds of malignancies. And because of the universal role of immune, you know, immune regulation in cancer formation, that's why these drugs are successful in so many different cancers. Um, so the next slide is what I wanted to tell you. I know it's very hard to read, but pretty early on, uh, some pattern emerged where we were a little disappointed on the overall response rate, right? So we think, oh, this is a powerful uh, mechanism. Let's do this. But then when you look at the trials, so the left side, this is all the different drugs. And then the middle column is the different tumor types. And then the right has all this information there. It's very hard to capture. But basically, if you look at ORR, that's overall response rate, you can see the numbers are not that great. And you know, like 8%, 12%, 22%, 38%. So majority of the trials showed a response rate really around 20 to 30%. So the majority of people actually did not benefit from this as, as really, you know, um, you think promising this is. But people looked into and they were thinking, so why would some people respond? Why would others not? But this is anti-PD-1, right? 
So the ligand of PD-1 that's expressed in the tumor cells, maybe they're thinking there's a correlation. If the tumor cells had more PD-L1, maybe then this drug would be more um, um, efficacious. So the top line there under the drug responses, you could see ORR like 8%, 12%, 22%, 43%. So there's a, there's a trend and that's for melanoma scores of zero through five. And what are those melanoma scores? That's a score that's based on PDL1 expression. So the more PDL1 there was on these melanoma cells, we saw more overall response. However, that's not universal. So some others, we don't have time to go into that, right? Some others, you don't see that pattern. So different drug companies have different strategies. Like nivolumab, the second drug there, that was actually the first approved PD-1 drug. Uh, the company of that drug opted to not look into anything like a PD-L1 expression. They just treated all cancer patients. They didn't care, okay? And they succeeded first. However, they suffered later because a lot of their following trials showed no difference. They can't demonstrate enough efficacy to get their drugs approved for certain things that they thought would work. Uh, but Merck made Pembro, Pembrolizumab or Keytruda, and they, for all their trials up front anyway, they would select the patient. They would test their tumor cells and see if there are PDL1 overexpression. And they, they will pay attention to that. Sometimes they excluded people with no PDL1 expression. Sometimes they, you know, they didn't do that. But then they tracked, and they, they actually had more data on the correlation between PDL1 in the tumor cells and their efficacy. But still, this is very confusing when everything was coming out, and it was coming out at us like crazy, right? All this data is coming. You go to a conference, and you can't follow. You don't know what's happening. Um, but anyway, so the next slide, I wanted to kind of take you back a little bit. So now we want to talk about colon cancer. So this is a paper published in 1996. Remember I was saying, so research was happening back then. So this is the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. At that time, it wasn't a drug yet. It was still in the lab, right? And so they treated um, mouse model or xenograft um, mouse model where the mouse has a transplanted colon cancer. And so they treated these mouse with anti-CTLA-4, the, the future drug. And the red triangle is the treated mouse. And the blue square is no treatment. And the, the green, smaller squ uh, squares are the CD28 is the activator. So if you anti-activator, you actually curb your immune defense, right? So then, sure enough, you see here, this is uh, the vertical axis is the average tumor size. So you could tell, right? So that's exactly what we, we learned, where if you curb the activity of your immune uh, uh, system with the top line, then the tumor grow bigger. But no treatment is like a control. And if you inhibit the inhibitor, then the tumor doesn't grow. So that's a, one of the earlier research. This is anti-CTLA4. The next slide would be the PD-1. So anti-PD-1. So that's the other inhibitor. And so this basically showed, again, is a mouse model. And the, the, if you, the left side panel is a knockout where the, the mice had no PD-1 expression. So their T cells just have no PD-1. Okay, so they actually fend off the tumors very nicely because without that, the control, you see the wild type, the, had, the tumor were bigger. But in the knockout mice, they're, they're smaller. And then the other one is instead of knockout, you give the, the mice treatment with this anti-PD-1, which is the drug later on. And then you see similar results. So these are earlier research in the 1990s. This one is 2004. And the next slide. So. Colon cancer, I was telling you, right? So in the earlier slides, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so in the earlier slides, recall that colon cancer was not listed there. 
So of all the drug approval, you know, different drugs, different indications, colon cancer wasn't there. Why? Because it's a little different. So this is a little bit about uh, metastatic colorectal cancer, okay? And we showed um, how these patients do depending on two markers. The MSI is called microsatellite instability. And then the BRAF is a mutation, it's a signaling uh, molecule in the cancer cells. So there is a wild type of those two, and there is a mutated of those two. If the cancer cells carry one or both of those mutations, they behaved much more aggressively. Okay, and the MSI is known as an indicator of the genome instability. Remember I was saying, so microsatellite instability, if it's a high instability, that means the genome of these cancer cells was very unstable, and so it's mutating all the time. So its capability to evade the immune system is just higher, right? Um, BRAF is a signaling molecule where it upregulates all the tumor replication, growth, and all that. It's a growth sig signal. So when these are in place, that's why the cancer is more aggressive. And the other one is the same, is a DMR, MMR is, is like a similar to the MSI. It's also in DNA repair machinery. So when that's deficient, then the tumor is more aggressive because you don't have a normal machinery to repair errors. So the errors are just rampant. And so, okay, eventually we'll take hold. So both are really illustrating the same. It's a different combination, the different colors, but the black on the top are the wild type, which means they're all intact. So these, these cancer, they're all metastatic colorectal cancer, but these type of cancers, actually they respond, um, you know, better to treatment and then they, they, their survival is a little longer. So the higher and further out, the better the survival. But if you have two markers, both are positive or bad, you can see the survival, you know, are more left shifted. So people actually die. You know, that's the horizontal axis is a month of survival. So colon cancer, then we know these are key factors. So then the next slide. So this is one of the trials that Merck run with this Keytruda. All their trials with Keytruda are called Keynote. And you can count, this is already 164. So how many trials they've run, right, in all different cancers. But anyway, this is a trial that they picked colorectal cancers with this MSI high, which means high instability, right? So that was a bad marker for the patient. They pick these patients and then treated them with um, addition of pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And so the next slide basically is a brief summary of in this trial there's a cohort uh, B where 63 patients they have these uh, high risk colorectal cancers. At least they've had one prior treatment, so usually chemotherapy. But mean is two prior therapies. Most people here have gone through two treatments, failed. So really, we had no good options at that point. And so then they were treated with this. And you can see that overall response rate is still 32%. I mean, that's in cancer therapeutics, that's huge. Because these people otherwise had no nothing. But in third line setting, right, you give them this treatment, then you save a third of people, or at least they have response. So that's really encouraging to, to see. And so the next slide. Now this is not just in colorectal cancer though. So scientists looked at all different types, see all those 12,000 types of tumors, and they characterized which type of tumor would have, tend to have this you know, MMR or MSI high. Uh, and then they saw, and then so the circled one is the colorectal cancer. So it's on the high end where we have more patients who have colorectal uh, cancer with this um, mismatch repair deficiency, which is just DNA repair deficiency. And so the next slide is based on this analysis. 
from five single arm keynote trials. And this is five trials, a total of only 149 patients. And that's another amazing thing that's happening in cancer research, right? In the past, we were doing clinical trials, especially breast cancer. We were doing clinical trials in like tens of thousands of patients to be able to get a end result to show that this intervention works. But now, we're making conclusions ba based on trials this small. And we're moving faster. And these are very meaningful, right? So this is 149 patients with all different kinds of cancer. Because the vertical, you could read that right? the top is colorectal cancer, endometrial, biliary, gastric. You know, of course, the colorectal cancer has the most patients, not reflecting real world incidents, more because of how these trials were run. So these patients happen to be in these trials. So they looked at these people, and then they looked at the efficacy of treatment. So the overall response rate is almost 40%. And these are all pre-treated patients. OK, so based on this little study, the next slide, then Kichuda really was a milestone. It became the first cancer treatment that is not tied to a certain type of cancer. In the past, we have approval for breast cancer. It's only good for breast cancer. Until you show it, do a different trial in different type of cancer, you can't really, doctors can't give it to the other patient unless you make a strong case. You have to file the insurance and all that, right? But now, if you can demonstrate this tumor has this MSI high signature, you can treat them regardless of where the cancer started. So that was really a big step forward and is very unconventional. Okay, so the next slide. So uh, nivolumab, which is um, Bristol-Myers Squibb, this is a different drug company, and they were actually the first company that invented these drugs, right? So they are really catching up now. So they looked at colorectal cancer um, as well and also selected these patients and they have to have um, failed one prior chemotherapy. And then they treated one group with nivolumab, which is anti-PD-1. And another group, they treated them with nivolumab plus EP. Remember, this is then like a double hit. So you're inhibiting CTLA-4 and you're inhibiting PD-1. Okay, these are those two drugs. So you have one group with just monotherapy, you have another group with two drugs. Okay, so then the next slide shows, this is just an illustration of, on the left is the monotherapy, on the right is the two drug group. Okay, so if you can gather a little bit, so it, it's, a, it's called a waterfall plot. So the bottom one basically is easier to follow where the blue bars just show the change of the, the, the tumor size, right? So if it, it's up, then that means that the, the cancer did not respond to treatment, actually grew bigger. If it's below, then they're actually smaller. So you could see the curve, the, the pattern, you know, the right one definitely is more efficacious, right? Because it shifted to the left. So more people, more cancer responded and had a deeper response as compared to the monotherapy, which is not like, you know, surprising because we've learned in fighting infection like HIV, right? You have to do combination treatment and in cancer immunotherapy or even chemotherapy where you, you hit the cancer cells at different points using different mechanisms, different drugs, and you hit it hard and then you usually get more efficacy out of it. But coming with it is more toxicity. So, um, so based on this, so right now, the NIVO EP, that's one of the approved indications in that busy uh, diagram I showed you before. Uh, they are now in second line. Remember, these are people who failed previous chemotherapy. But now, there's a phase three trial where they're doing the two drug combination. They're treating people with this first line. And that's showing efficacy that's better than chemotherapy. So we're expecting this to come 
up as a first line option for people. But this is for people with colorectal cancer with this MSI high or DMMR. So, okay, so it's a DNA repair deficiency. So if you have that, and who are the people? So the people with Lynch syndrome, that's a syndrome that can run in the family, um, they have these mutations, but it can be random. So all cancer, like metastatic colorectal cancer patients, automatically get tested for these things, just because we can treat them differently. Okay, the next slide. No, I'm doing okay on time. Okay, so let's, okay, this is just a different way of showing that um, the orange is a two drug combination, and then the faint line is a one drug. You can see left is progression-free survival, right is overall survival, which we can relate better. So you can see the two drug is better than one drug in terms of survival. So next slide. Okay, so challenges in cancer immunotherapy, especially in this so-called checkpoint. So these, these drugs that I talked to you about. I want you to read that quote, right? This is from a really famous pathologist. He was the president of the American Pathology uh, Society back in the 1920s, you know, uh, very respected. He would say it would be as difficult to reject the right ear and leave the left ear intact as it is to immunize against cancer. And we can understand that, right? Just because you really have to separate tumor from normal cells. And um, that's how tricky it is for our immune system to figure out to do. Now, side effects. So I want to go to the next slide. Side effects I mentioned because it's, it's waking up the immune system and it leads to a kind of like a hyper-regulated immune system. So it kind of mimics the autoimmune disease. Right, so if you know someone with autoimmune disease, it's not a very comfortable disease to live with. So people can have rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, it can be multi-organ involvement. So um, fortunately, this is not really common common. I mean, it's not like the majority of patients do just fine or they have very mild side effects. But it can involve multiple organs and it's like an inflammation of your organ. It can be inflame the thyroid and then become hypothyroid. It can be hepatitis, pneumonitis, colitis, it's itis. Itis means inflammation. So that's really what it is. So these are the side effects. And then because they're happening, because we're using this for all different cancers, right? So there's a paper written about these side effects and what do you do with it. And that was published in the uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology. It's like a book, it's one article. So it's not all like, you know, free lunch. So you have to pay a price, potential price anyway. So the next slide. Uh, so another is to manage our expectation, right? Because I said it's not 100% effective. Majority of people actually don't benefit from it. But then you are at risk of side effects. How do we, how do we select patients? How do we overcome that? Biomarkers, markers, right? PDL1 expression in tumor cells, this um, MSI high, these are markers. And we're still developing uh, knowledge on what's a reliable marker. So we can pick patients where this drug has more chance to succeed. So, so that's, um, but. The one thing is understanding how it works is like a switch, right? Your immune system was inhibited. Now you treat with this drug. Now the immune system is activated. It's like a switch. So for people who develop the side effect, they may stop this drug, but the benefit does not stop. And so that's really remarkable. And I have personal experience of a patient here, actually in Los Alamos. Uh, she was treated for seven months, and now she's two years out off of any treatment and she's stable. So it's really good. So it has a long lasting efficacy. So that's good. So the next, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I will just bypass this, but this is, I, I wanted to talk about variability or why we're, we can't predict, why there are all these people are different. Our genetics are different. And everybody's immune system is different. How it presents the tumor cells is different, and the tumor cells are different. Even the same breast cancer, they're not the same in different people. So the variability is everywhere. And even our 
um, microbiome is called, or the microenvironment surrounding the cancer is different. Some people have, you know, whether we, we take the antibiotics that changes the, the bacterial flora in our gut, that can have an impact on this as well because it modulates our immune system, right? So all these are variables, and they're so vast, it's really hard to draw good conclusions until we really accumulate enough data. So the next one, uh, okay, we really don't have a handle, especially in um, real time. So the next slide, uh, and the last point on this is the scary thing is that when you sign on a, a clinical trial with a promising drug, and then you find that, so in this trial, it was actually related, this type of lymphoma is related with a certain type of virus, uh, viral infection, but three patients died um, on this trial, and they and made the next slide a New York Times, of course. Um, so even though this is promising, the one word of caution is wait until we have data. Don't put yourself at risk if you don't know. You know, not all cancers would respond the same. So I have patients who come to me, like they have so many questions. So if I don't have any data, I really do not recommend taking the risk. Okay, so um, next slide. So CAR T is really cool. And if we can go to that clip, um, I, we can just zoom through this quickly. But I wanted to show you a little clip on this, you know, CAR T cell, so it's chimeric antigen receptor T cell immunotherapy. I think you just have to click that play button. I saw that button there. You have to just, you have to get your cursor. Uh, is it yeah, here? Yeah, the other guy left. Oh, it's on Chrome? I think so. Yeah. I don't know where he had it. Where is it? I don't know. He didn't tell me where it was. He said if I just iconified it, I'd yeah. see it. Yeah, okay. Well, we are running out of time, so. Oh, Did I can it? see it there. But let's see if I move my mouse, does it? It was right there. Oh well. I don't know where it went. I mean, I so you have two screens here. Yes, I do. You slide it and the screen so I can't bring it up. Although. Oh, well, I mean, is that it? Okay. Well, we can't see it, and I don't want to waste your time. So I would just say. Uh, so if we go, oh, there. CAR T cell therapy, which is a type of adoptive cell immunotherapy is custom made for each patient from their own white blood cells. First, the patient's T cells are collected from their blood. Then an artificial gene for a specific receptor is inserted into these cells in a laboratory. These modified cells are called CAR T cells. After the CAR T cells multiply in the lab, they are injected into the patient. The receptors on the CAR T cells help them find and destroy cancer cells throughout the patient's body. In 2017, the FDA approved two CAR T cell therapies for use in different cancers, and there are more CAR T cell therapies that appear very promising for additional cancers. Unlike most cancer treatments, CAR T cell therapy typically needs to be given only once because CAR T cells multiply in the patient's body with their anti-cancer effects persisting and even increasing over time. In 2018, the American Society of Clinical Oncology named CAR T cell therapy the advance of the year. There, isn't that wonderful? So you got the best and the highlight of what's been happening just really like right now. So um, I will just then go past the next slide, basically tells you 
about the two drugs that are, or the CAR T cell therapies from two different companies. And this is approved for diffuse large B cell, which is a very aggressive, supposedly curable <coughs> lymphoma. However, in the few patients that recur, then we really don't have great treatment. So, but this, imagine that they get this one-time treatment, and then, you know, and it's, the response rate is really good. So the next slide, uh, there are a couple slides that should just show that how people respond to this. This is overall survival. And when it flat, flattens out, you know these people are living. Now one marker, so here, how well people do depends on what kind of response they have up front. So you can see to the left, those are people with different. So the top is complete response, and then objective response, partial response, just a little bit difficult, you know, like technical. Uh, definition, but depending on upfront, what kind of response you got. If you got a complete response, you can look at that line. With time, about 70% people would have like a sustained remission and just one-time treatment. That's it. So I mean, that's just like remarkable, right? But not everybody would have a complete response. If you have a partial response, then you still need something down the road. But so the next slide. Okay, again, so this is depending on what type of lymphoma. If you had diffuse large B cell lymphoma that got re like refractory, you got this treatment, versus follicular lymphoma is a different kind, more indolent, that can transform to aggressive, but you treat with CAR T cell. You can see those patients do much better. So there's still subtle difference. So the next slide. So the two, these two, um, CAR T cell therapies are, next slide please, are approved and then they're pretty similar, a little subtle difference on their toxicity profile. And so, because this actually is not for the faint of heart. Um, so the next slide, um, there are toxicities related to this and, and these can be deadly. So this so-called cytokine release syndrome because you are getting infusion of these activated immune cells, T cells, they can really just go activate everything and attack, you know, or just have a um, cytokine storm release all these active, active compounds. And so cause, the main thing is the neurotoxicity. And, um, and also people can go in cardiac arrest or they have multi-organ dysfunction. So the first, you could think of the first people who had trials with this. Right? And the physicians were learning day by day, looking at those patients and figuring out things to, to help control this. So now it's very mature. So they have ways of uh, preventing this or managing this. Uh, but it's not happening in every community center. We don't do this here. So if you want this therapy, you have to go to the tertiary cancer centers. So that's just that. So the next slide. Okay, so some of the challenges, the cost consideration is really huge. I just Googled and I found these numbers. I mean, you can see, you know, billions of dollars um, in the national um, just estimate. And then just these CAR T cells, one treatment, right? But then you have to collect the cells, engineering the cells, infuse back to the patient. So each patient, the treatment is about, what, 400 to 500,000 per person. And then the immunotherapy that I talked about, the other, the checkpoint, uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4 inhibitors, each treatment average 10 to 13,000. And these are treatment people are getting every two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. So the cost is just tremendous. As a nation, as a world, how do we cope? I, I don't have an answer. But again, to be specific, to find markers where we select patients, not only to help you know, prevent waste, but also to avoid side effects, because nothing is like harmless, right? So there are potential downsides. So the next slide, this is a summary. Basically, I, you know, there's a hype versus hope. And the last bullet is, it's still the early stage. We're still learning. This is just, you know, there's so much potential. And the next slide, Okay, I have to tell you about this, because this girl, this little girl, she was the first patient to receive CAR T therapy. And she is the, one of the unfortunate childhood leukemia 
um, refractory patient, right? We know we can treat childhood leukemia ALL really successfully, like 80% um, cure. She was the 10 to 20%. And so by the time she was treated, she was seven. That's her. And she had the cytokine storm. And she almost died. She was in the ICU. And then the doctors were really trying to put their heads together and came up with some regimen that saved her around. This is a picture from last year. See, her treatment was almost, what, seven years ago? Yeah, so now she's, um, she was seven, so she's going to turn 14 in May. This was last year's picture, so she'll take another picture every year. She's so it's just so exciting, you know, to see this making a difference. And I want to tell you about the, my last slide is this book. If you haven't read it, highly, highly recommend it. It's so inspiring. It won the Pulitzer nonfiction years ago. Uh, and then PBS made a three-episode series, mini-series. And because the book was published in the like early 2013-ish, something like that. So the later um, breakthrough was not really covered in the book, but in the series. So the next slide, the third episode actually touched upon, there's a three minute um, you know, coverage of uh, Emily, so this little girl, like her journey uh, you know, with the CAR T immunotherapy. So I just think it's really inspiring and is a must read for anyone who, who wants to know um, something about the history of cancer and cancer therapy. So I'm sorry I went over time. So if you have questions, I'll stay around. I see some, oh, cards, great. I can just. For here. Okay. How about immunotherapy for stage four breast cancer? One of those approvals is for breast cancer. <laughs> so um, I think it's Kichuda for triple negative. So breast cancer, it's all, there's still all these trials are ongoing. With time, we'll get more indications, more approvals. But again, don't, you know, be patient. Don't feel left out if your disease is not covered yet. It's better to take that time. Let the trials happen and we learn. And if anything, if you want to sign up trials, I think that's a wonderful thing because then that's how we learn, right? And we at the Santa Fe Cancer Center, we have our clinical trial program. We're actually building a phase one, phase two. So early phase, people tend to, in the past, have to travel to the big cancer centers. It's very hard for a community to support early stage, um, early phase trials, but we're building that program. So we'll have that opportunity as well. Uh, you can always bring this up with your oncologist and see if uh, you're eligible. Otherwise, a lot of the traditional treatment is still very good, you know, like the BCG for superficial bladder cancer, it was way back. It was in 1970s. It was one of the first immuno cancer therapy. And it's still the standard. We still use it. It works. So don't give up on existing treatment options. Don't think this is the magic for you. Okay? So just if we have the data, we can guide you. We want to do it safely. But, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, it's just very promising. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. In the combination of EP, NEVO, uh, is that, that, that's, that is, both are IO. Both the EP and, and the NEVO are uh, immuno-oncolytics. Mm -hmm. So that is the treatment. Mm -hmm. What percentage of patients do not experience uh, reduction in tumor? So these are is this a colorectal cancer or is this melanoma? Melanoma. melanoma. You know, I have to um, go back to the paper to dig up all these specifics. So but one thing that's interesting is immunotherapy, we, don't, we can't really measure the success of it based on the measurement of the tumor. Sometimes we can. Because immuno, immunotherapy goes to kind of activate and attack and cause inflammation. And inflammation is swelling, 
right? And so the tumor may appear to be bigger, especially at the beginning. And you do a scan, you look at it, you're like, oh my God, this has pro progressed. Uh, the treatment didn't work, but that's not true. So you just have to, it's called a pseudo progression. You kind of have to be patient. If you're tolerating the treatment, no side effects yet, keep going, okay, allow time. And then eventually when the tumor truly has shrunk, and there's no doubt that this treatment is working, then you know it's working. So there are a lot of the, these little, you know, more details where only your doctors would know. Um, so you can't, I say, you know, you can't practice medicine by looking up Dr. Google or, you know, like read headlines because it's never that simple because there are a lot of things. So you just have to talk to your doctor and ask some questions so that they can help you. Okay. Any other questions? Is CAR T therapy limited to lymphoma? No. So. It is a challenge where um, solid tumor, CAR T cell therapy is being tested in solid tumor. So far, we are limited with success. I think part of it is delivery of these cells, you know, to get to the solid tumor and penetrate and work there versus lymphoma or leukemia. It's more like in your circulation, so the access is readily available. So. Um, I think, so there are technical challenges, but there are ways to get around it. Um, I, I think eventually this, this uh, technology will, will be able to help solid tumor as well. Yeah. No more questions? Yeah, sure. As we learn more about the biome and feeding the biome improves your immune system, is there any research on that? that yeah, I'm out? sure it's ongoing. I think the thing is like when people ask me about supplements or nutrition or diet, it's so difficult uh, until people do clinical trials where you control this, right? You only allow this, you don't allow that, then you, you have a very clear answer. Otherwise, in the real world, it's all mixed. There's so many variables again. So it's very hard to draw a clear conclusion. But one thing we know, fitness, physical fitness, and uh, you know, general overall health is absolutely essential in our fight over cancer, right? Because that means our immune system is intact. So when you do physical activities, that's you're boosting your immune system. So you are at least delaying or, you know, um, the cancer from happening further down the road. And even if cancer happened, then you would be fit, you have less, um, no comorbidities, treatment would be more straightforward, you can tolerate the treatment better, longer, to allow it to work. And so I think the secret, really, anyone, that's a no-brainer, just eat healthy, stay active, and try to control the weight so that we don't, you know, because with that, there, there are other diabetes, heart disease, you know, could be dif more difficult, but it's not impossible, right? It just makes it more complicated. Yeah. Yes. I found one of your slides very interesting. So yeah. Why? Uh, my question is, you have different medical I, I call them medication, but they're different. Yeah, they are. Different drugs. But some of them treat more than one type of cancer. Yeah. Okay, and my question is, how are those cancers related that they can work by the same? Uh, yeah, because it's really a general mechanism, right? Because this, this immune evasion is a common um, strategy for, the, for all different kinds of cancer cells. Um, so that's why you have this drug, then you can use it for, it's like chemotherapy. It's really the same mechanism where it kills all fast growing cells. So you can use chemotherapy in different cancers, although you have to test out different chemotherapies. You know? And this is the same thing because of mechanism action is really kind of universal you know, uh, in all cancers. Um, so that's why. But some cancers are more 
immunogenic, like melanoma or kidney cancer. They are known by um, happening uh, through evading the, the immune defense. And that's their main mechanism. Okay, so that's why those tend to be the, uh, the first set of diseases that were used in the clinical trials. Melanoma was the first success. And then the other cancers are more like a trickling down. So if we don't have better options, let's give it a try. But not all would work, right? Like that T-cell lymphoma leukemia case, uh, it probably just mechanism of action is a little bit different. Um, so when you use this, it could even cause harm. Um, so, so that's, yeah, that's all these uh, drugs are now being tested in different cancers. And some more, you're seeing more just because those drugs were um, approved earlier. They were older drugs, so they, they have more data. More trials now have results. The other companies are busy running all these trials, trying to beat each other. And that's the other thing, because I used to do research, right? I, I, me too drug is kind of, it bothers me. Because instead of investing in more innovation, all these companies are competing, trying to carve out a little slice in the market so they can make money. I mean, that's really plain and, and simple. So talking about the cost, I think a lot of it, it really takes all the smartest people to overcome greed to really put the benefits of the patients um, first and, and then to do the right things. But nobody is going to blink first, right? All these companies, they're not going to, they're like, okay, this still makes money, I'm, I'm going to go after that. So th all those are different companies. But if they don't make money, they can't invest in more research. They're spending so much money marketing, doing TV commercials, and that's why they charge you an arm and leg on these drugs. Yeah, absolutely. So we are getting this because of all the research all these people did decades ago, right? But now you can sense the environment. You know, the money is being pulled out of research. And so, yeah, I think we'll, we'll pay the price down the road. But, uh, you know, it all started from genome research, DNA sequencing. We understood about the genome instability, you know, how all these specific interactions work. It's, we came a long way. And so research is, I'm really passionate about it because that's how we can make progress. We can do better. But I don't know, some people probably don't care. And you get sick, too bad. That's how the, to rule the world, right? Yeah, but anyway. Any all other right. questions? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They have a higher activity of their immune system. Right. Are they less likely to have cancer? No, that's, that's the, the bad part about it. So hyperimmune um, activity is this immune dysregulation. Okay, you have a lot of these activities, but they're all noise. They actually distract your normal function from carrying out. So people with autoimmune disease, they are more at risk of blood, uh, like having lower white blood cell counts as their immune system, and they're more at risk to infections and treatment to autoimmune disease because you have to kind of tune down the immune system. Again, put people in at risk of infection. So it's like, a, yeah, all bad. But again, if we can develop the balance, right? So autoimmune disease, patients with that are usually excluded from all these trials. But there's a thought that if these people, if people have had treatment and they're really doing fine, and they, they're not symptomatic, they don't have, you know, they're okay. Even if they have to take some treatment like prednisone, right, that's anti-inflammatory. If it's less than 10 milligram once a day, then maybe they're eligible for the immunotherapy. They used to be excluded. Now there are trials for those people just to try to maximize all this benefit. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gu, for- <laughs> My pleasure.